Safer Chemicals Podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals. Welcome to the Safer Chemicals Podcast. My name is Päivi Jokiniemi. In this episode, we'll speak about the first Biocidal Products Committee meeting for this year, 2022. And with me, as usual, I have Erik van der Plasch, chair of our Biocidal Products Committee. Welcome, Erik. Good morning. Hello. Good to be here. For those not so familiar with the committee and its work, let's just have a quick recap. So it prepares scientific opinions for the European Commission on biocidal active substances and on EU-wide authorizations of biocidal products. Uh, The Commission then takes the final decisions based on the opinions they receive from the Biocidal Products Committee. Um, So as said, this year's first meeting has just ended and Erik is here to share with us the highlights. Uh, Erik, great to have you here again. Um, Let's get started, right? Yeah. I think we'll start with the Biocidal um, Active Substances. Um, First on the list, I have uh, methylene dithiocyanate, also known as MBT, uh, which is a slimicide and belongs to product type 12. Uh, It's in in the review program Mm -hmm. uh, and has been evaluated by France. Uh, What can you tell about this active substance and the the discussion that you had? Yeah, the discussion we had on this one, which was the the first uh, indeed active substance approval dossier we had at the meeting. Quite straightforward, I must say. So uh, it's a substance indeed used as a slimy side already for a very long time. It's an old one. But uh, yeah, the, the evaluation clearly demonstrated that there are uh, unacceptable risks for the environment due to the properties of this substance, which uh, can by no means uh, mitigate it. So France, as an evaluating CA, Let's say they try to do their best in a sense that they looked at best conditions while we normally look at uh, what we call realistic worst case conditions. So higher dilution factors, for example, when the uh, substance is released to the environment. But in all situations, there was an uh, unacceptable risk. So in that sense, there was another reason for for non-approval, but I won't go into details about that. But main main thing was the the environment uh, where the committee clearly concluded that this is an unacceptable risk. We cannot mitigate. It does not meet the conditions of approval. So the uh, proposal from the committee will be to uh, not approve this substance, and that means it will be banned from the European market. Okay, good. Um, Then moving on to the next substance. Um, This is a new active substance, um, Mm -hmm. a pheromone, um, and it would be used as a deterrent in product type 19. Um, I believe there's an interesting story behind behind this one. Yeah, this is uh, an interesting one. In a sense, maybe uh, yeah, it, it's uh, used as indeed in prototype 19. It's a, it's a pheromone, and it's used for the control of uh, processionary moths. And maybe that's not so uh, let's say well known to everybody, but it's about the caterpillars of this moth which uh, have brist- brittles on their at the outside of their body. And these can become airborne, so they can spread through the air. For example, you have nests in, in oaks, in pine trees, especially in oaks. Um, and it's a plague. It's really a plague. Uh, you have it in the Netherlands, you have it in the, the southern part of, uh, of Europe. And these, these bristles, they can lead to severe uh, yeah, health problems. Going from a rash, uh, so they are skin irritants, but if you inhale them, then you can have really severe problems. So you can have inflammation in your, in your mouth. It can even lead to, uh, to asthma. So this is really a severe problem within the, yeah, within the EU. Um, it's even moving north uh, because of climate change. So these moss, they nestle also in uh, yeah, trees uh, more up north. And uh, this is an, a new method developed to, uh, to do something about this, uh, about this plague. Um, 
where we have we have alternative methods. So you have BTI, for example, which is used uh, in my home country in the Netherlands where I live. There are also other, let's say, non-chemical methods. But this is a new method to uh, yeah to combat this uh, these caterpillars. And the way it works is that the the males they get uh, disturbed when they are exposed to this pheromone. Uh, so mating is uh, disturbed, and that uh, that means in the end that the nest is uh, yeah is is, is going down, um, and it works via an interesting method. So you have uh, an air gun, which is for example also used in in paint uh, paint uh, paintball air, yeah, and they shoot these uh, balls into the canopy of the of the oak of the tree, and uh, the ball explodes. And then the water which is in it will evaporate. Uh, so you should not apply it when it starts to rain. It, there needs to be dry conditions, of course. So the ball explodes in the canopy of the tree. Uh, the water evaporates and then you get a thin wax layer on the tree. Um, and there the pheromone starts to uh, slowly release from this layer. It's a micro encapsulation, as we call it, in these balls. Um, and then slowly, slowly, slowly it evaporates and the, the caterpillars, the moss which are in the, uh, in the tree, start to be exposed to this pheromone and then it, it does its action. Okay. It's a new method which uh, yeah, is brought on the market now by, uh, by a company. It's already approved in some uh, member states, a provisional authorization they're having over there. And now we had the discussion in the committee on, uh, on, this, uh, on this substance. And I must say that first of all, we will we did all agree that this substance should be approved uh, in terms of risks. There's not that much going on. Uh, it's a pheromone. Um, there are classes, let's say, of pheromones which have already been approved under the R framework, but also under the PPP. And in fact, there were maybe two issues. So first of all, the efficacy. Uh, uh, so it demonstrates its efficacy. So that's, of course, uh, let's say good news for people who are dealing with this issue. Uh, the other thing was that the company had a limited data, data package. Uh, because you're dealing with a pheromone, we're dealing with very low concentrations which are needed uh, for this kind of uh, applications. And the company waived uh, a lot of uh, toxicological and ecotoxicological uh, data. Also because they say it can only be used by this application. So using it with an air gun, taking measures around the tree that nobody can uh, be exposed. And in the end, that's also what we laid down in the approval. That uh, normally we have approval which is what we call open, but this one is very closed in a sense that you can only use it via this application method, in fact. And that might lead to some concerns, but that's more a regulatory concern for the Commission that uh, if others come, they can only use it in this very strict, narrow way. So we think uh, it should be approved. But in the, in the next step of the process, there might be some debate in a regulatory sense on whether the approval should, not, should be maybe more open or whether we leave it, uh, we leave it as it is. But that would mean that whoever is, is applying, whoever is using this, uh, this air gun would need to be trained to do the, to yeah, do the work. Yeah, but, but that's indeed what, what's really, uh, let's say if you look at the instructions for products which are already on the market, the instruction is that it can only be used by trained professionals. So indeed, you need somebody who needs to, yeah, who's able to work with such a gun. Uh, he needs to know how to load it, of mm. course. Uh, to shoot it, uh, the param there should be a parameter around the tree where people should not come when you are doing your job. So it's really only for for uh, for professionals. Um, finally, you discussed uh, propiconazol, which is mm -hmm. a wood preservative in product type eight, um, and there it was about renewal, right? Yeah. Yeah. What can you tell about this? Yeah, it's indeed about renewal. Uh, propiconazol is a uh, a wood preservative, uh, one of the most important wood preservatives uh, on the European market. Uh, we got information from Finland as a competent authority that about 60% of the uh, products authorized within the EU for wood preservation contain uh, propiconazole. 
so it's a very important one for the EU market. It's a fungicide. There are more fungicides, but this is the one uh, which is the most important. It belongs to a class of azoles. So there are a couple of, let's say, brothers or sisters, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm who uh, belong to the same class, but this is the first one which comes up, uh, comes up for uh, renewal. So we uh, agreed on the, uh, on the opinion for uh, propiconazole. Um, yeah, and in terms of approval or non-approval, this substance is meeting the uh, exclusion criteria. Okay. So because of its uh, toxicity for reproduction, but it has also been identified as meeting the uh, criteria for endocrine disruption. So it's an endocrine disruptor. And that means that we cannot approve the substance unless there is a derogation condition which is uh, fulfilled. And I guess the audience is well aware now of what, uh, what is meant by uh, derogations in our framework. So that means that we recommend that it cannot be approved unless the derog one of the derogation conditions is, uh, is met. Um, and in this case? In this case, we need to see. Okay. We really don't know at the moment whether that will, uh, that will be the case. Okay. Um, we had a lot of discussion again around the risk assessment for uh, ED properties. So as it meets the uh, ED criteria, there's also the need, uh, at least requested by the European Commission, to look at the risks coming from these ED properties. And in a previous podcast, we had it about uh, DBMPA and cyanamide. And again, here we had this case that we could not conclude on uh, whether the risks coming from these ED properties are acceptable or not acceptable. We simply cannot conclude at the moment when we have uh, such a substance. So that is going to be laid down in the, uh, in the opinion and for sure that's going to be an issue for the Commission when they receive, uh, receive our opinion. Um, yeah, and in terms of these derogations, that needs to be seen. But one of the important elements over there is the analysis of, uh, of alternatives uh, because you need to look at whether there are uh, suitable and sufficient alternatives before you can decide on whether these derogation conditions are met. Mm -hmm. So that was an important element also of the work done by, uh, by Finland. Um, and yeah, we had some conclusions, let's say, on some of the uses. There are many uses of propiconazole. As I said, it, it's one of the most uh, well-known uh, preservatives. So. It's used in uh, various uh, applications. We have what we call different use classes, and it's used in almost uh, all use classes we have, two, three, and four, for the ones who are informed. But for example, in, uh, in wood joinery, it is used in your windows, indoors. Uh, so it's, in fact, it's used all over the place. And um, yeah, there are, alternatives for some of the applications, but we could not really conclude, I must say, on for which uh, type of uses there are alternatives and for which type of uses there are not. And that's for sure going to be an issue which will be dealt with again by the Commission when they receive this opinion. They will need to do further work probably on uh, yeah, this analysis of alternatives, which is a difficult topic. I can come back on that later. Um, and they will launch a consultation again on uh, whether these conditions are met. And then this analysis for sure will, uh, will come back. It could end up being so that for some uses, there might be an approval at the end and for others, maybe not. Well, that's indeed, uh, that's a good question. That's indeed the, yeah, the whole purpose of the exercise in a sense that uh, you might want to uh, uh, exclude or ban certain uses for which you have sufficient and suitable alternatives. And uh, yeah, my gut feeling at the moment is that we, we uh, either we do not know whether there are alternatives for certain uses where we see there are, but we do not know whether they are sufficient, whether they are suitable, whether they are available on the market. Uh, 
which would leave us to conclude that, uh, yeah, maybe it's not time at this point of time. We need to have more information, etc. And then maybe at the next renewal, we can take a more definite decision. But it still remains to be seen because there's this whole process which needs to be taken and needs to take place once we have from, uh, sent our opinion to the Commission. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, that was all about the um, active substances then. Um, then there were some union authorization cases yeah. also. Uh, would there be something that you'd like to, to mention here? Yeah, we had five uh, union authorization applications where I would say three were straightforward. We had two based on uh, propanol, this hand disinfection, mm-hmm. for example, which you've seen many times, so those went easily through. So we recommend uh, that these products can be authorized. Uh, we had one based on lactic acid, uh, also in the disinfectant market, which was also quite similar. So that also went through the most uh, controversial ones. And maybe there's something to say about those were two which are based on uh, active chlorine. Um, and these are active chlorine releasers. So you have sodium hypochlorite which is put in the bottle, let's say, and then it releases uh, active chlorine. Um, And the issue we had, and we've had that now already several times, and it will probably even come back, is that uh, active chlorine is an unstable substance. So uh, what happens is that, especially for liquid uh, products, and everybody knows toilet bowel disinfection, for example, or even uh, uh, detergent cleaning your toilet bowels with, uh, with chlorate. Um, and this is then a disinfection product, so this is for the professional market. Mm-hmm. But it happens especially for liquid products or, f- or for concentrates, so concentrates which you need to dilute before you can, uh, you can apply them. Um, And what happens indeed is that you have this degradation of active chlorine within the bottle, and that leads to the formation of chlorate. And chloride, chlorate, we have some concerns about uh, about chlorate, especially with respect to its uh, human health uh, properties. Um, So there are then a couple of issues. We have this, what we call a storage stability testing, which is needed to establish a shelf life. How long can you put the product on the shelf because you don't want to have that you start with a product and for example you have a shelf life of two years and after the two years it should still work. So we have a test where we look at the degradation of the uh, substance over the shelf life to establish a shelf life. For example we have products where we say it cannot be the shelf life of six months but it cannot go up to two to three years depending on the stability of the substance. Um, And in this case, we see some degradation, um, which even goes over the limit we have in our tests, uh, which is 10% degradation over the the test. Um, There in this case, we, yeah, the issue was then also, we have so much degradation, uh, we need to prevent that. Can we set a kind of a threshold? Maybe not more than 50% can be degraded. Because if you still use it at the end, you might have some overdosing of your product. Um, Or on the other hand, we also had maybe at the end of the the storage, you still do your efficacy testing. So if you can demonstrate then that it's efficacious, then you might still allow this longer shelf life. So we had all these issues. Um, We even had that at the start of the test, the substance was already what we call outside a certain specification, so the degradation was already quite long, which had to do maybe with the, uh, the, the time lapse between the manufacturing of the product and the start of the test. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a kind of an artifact, one might say, in your, in your, in your test. So all these issues we, we had where we, in the end, agreed on what we call a kind of a pragmatic approach where we said as long as the efficacy is demonstrated at the end then we will still uh, allow such a product on the market with a certain shelf life on the other hand uh, yeah there were not all members agreeing there were three minority opinions on uh, on this opinion 
So for sure, this is an issue which will need uh, more discussion, where on the one hand it will be, do we want to prevent overdosing? So uh, that's something we will still need to uh, need to discuss, where there is maybe a need for a kind of a cut-off value. Mm -hmm. The other main thing is then, uh, do we really, or do we really, do we allow that already at the start of a test we have this uh, degradation, which may even be, uh, let's call it, too high, and there we really have difference of opinions within the within the within the committee. So it's an issue that will not uh, go away for sure. It was good that we adopted these opinions, mm -hmm. which can now be taken up by the commission. But for sure, we will have some uh, more discussion, and I guess especially at technical level. So we have a working group dealing with this, and they will need to do more work on uh, these substances which are not stable. And active chlorine is not the only one. There are more who have this, this property. So uh, we need to set some more uh, rules, uh, I would say. Okay, the work continues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, then coming back to something that you actually mentioned earlier when mm -hmm. you were talking about um, active substances and also something that we we discussed in our October podcast. So this is the draft guidance that um, ECA is preparing for uh, analyzing alternatives to active substances. Mm -hmm. um, back in October, you um, you explained that until now there hasn't really been any guidance available yep. uh, that uh, that could be used for this for this purpose. Um, so I'm sure there are many now who would be eager to know where 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 you are with this mm -hmm. with this work. What's how the progress looks like? Yeah, um, yeah. We we worked more on uh, having this guidance on the analysis of alternatives, uh, which is an important issue. Uh, as mentioned also in this previous mm -hmm. podcast, we really would like to improve the work we are doing on the analysis of alternatives. Um, so we developed uh, this guidance uh, as an agency and now presented it for the first time to uh, to the member states or to the members of the committee, um, where we relied a lot on REACH because in REACH we have uh, quite some experience uh, on this topic. So it was, well, I wouldn't say a full copy and paste of what we have on the REACH, but we relied a lot of uh, what is done over there. And we try to target it uh, a bit also to the biocides framework, where, for example, for substances meeting exclusion, this is important, where there's also an obligation for companies to submit uh, the analysis of alternatives, but also for meet substitution, this is something which needs to be, uh, needs to be done. Um, and I must say, uh, yeah, the guidance was received with some quite some critical comments uh, although there was also let's say appreciation i would say for the work we we did and i guess that more that it it yeah at least now down a framework so what where do we need to look at in terms of risks uh, technical feasibility economic feasibility availability of alternatives as such and having some guidance on how to do the work but we also developed some formats uh, and a, a process uh, which we think will need to be followed, first of all by, by the industry when they submit their application, but also then for member states when they uh, do the evaluation uh, work. And especially on the last part, uh, members were quite, uh, quite critical in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, it needs resources, of course, the uh, the analysis, and it's new for us, uh, and especially with the short deadlines we have and the resource situation in member states, there was this uh, fear, this sense uh, that uh, if we are going to adopt such a guidance and member states really would need to do uh, this work, then, uh, yeah, that would not be possible according to uh, several members who spoke. Um, from our side, we would say we're well aware of this issue, that uh, member states, for example, they don't get uh, fees for uh, the evaluation work, for, for sure, when a substance is meeting a substitution. Um, there's often not that much expertise in member states, so there's also a learning process uh, over there. 
And the short timelines we are having, that really makes uh, the work, of course, uh, difficult. And coming back a bit to, to propiconazole, and we had another substance uh, which we discussed this meeting, which was uh, hexaflumeron, where we asked the Greek authorities to work on the, uh, on the analysis of alternatives before we start uh, deriving and uh, drafting an opinion on the renewal of this uh, of this uh, insecticide which is used for termite control we saw the issues over there that uh, member states are asking how deep do we need to go and one of the main problems and that we realize also very well is that uh, there is an applicant there there's a company who wants to defend uh, their substance and they submit a lot of information and of course they submit a lot of if I may call it critical information on the alternative, and it's difficult to get, let's say, the other side of the story. So we had some, yeah, proposals and the guidance on how to uh, how to get that information also in our public consultations, which might be useful, we would say. But I think, yeah, for sure, we will need some further discussion on uh, on the whole uh, guidance. What we mm -hmm intend to do now is to yeah to discuss a bit internally on how we move forward maybe we will split the guidance in for applicants and for for uh, for member states uh, but for sure yeah we are not yet there yet so we will need some further reflection on how to move forward back to the drawing board e yeah <laughs> a bit like this yes yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah do you have any estimation that you can give that um, when would you have the next draft ready or when mm. even you might have the have the guidance mm. ready for publication uh, well, our intention was to have it uh, at the next meeting, mm -hmm. uh, but there was a clear message that uh, we will not ad adopt or agree on such a guidance. For sure, when we look at the aspect related to uh, to member states. Um, so, I don't know at the moment. I think if we, let's say, take of course the member state part out and we, we focus on industry, then it's something we can, uh, we can adopt. But as said, we indeed we need to go a bit back to uh, the drawing board, uh, not start from scratch, of course, mm. but see what we do, a little bit of a strategy on how to move forward in this case. And from our side, it, it's really still an, an it's an important topic, of course, for sure, for substance to meet exclusion, and I guess that's well realized by everyone. Mm. But uh, yeah, in biocides, we suffer a lot from uh, shortage of resources combined with short deadlines. So uh, yeah. Doing something on in one area comes at a cost for another area, so it's all about uh, the striking the right balance. Okay, we'll continue following this topic then. Sure. Throughout the year, um, and actually coming then to my next point here. So these were the highlights from the first meeting. Um, I'm a little bit curious now to know what's what's coming during the rest of the the year. Mm -hmm. We'll be meeting each other, of course, and speaking about what happens and what are the mm -hmm. highlights. But maybe you can already tell something what the to the listeners. What can we expect? Yeah, um, yeah. We still have three meetings. Um, for sure, we hope, uh, but as a society, uh, that we would like to have uh, face to face. We had another mm -hmm. virtual one, and we hope now to. Corona crisis is moving away that we can have some face-to-face -face meetings uh, this year. That would be really good. Um, we'll have a couple of active substances and uh, union authorizations for sure coming. I think we will end up with uh, quite more opinions than we had uh, last year for sure for union authorization. But an interesting one to mention is maybe the comparative assessment for rodenticides, for uh, anticoagulant rodenticides, which is an opinion we uh, hope to adopt uh, in the last meeting of this year. And that's one of uh, the most interesting ones or most relevant ones, uh, I must say. Um, where the Commission has asked us to perform this comparative assessment for uh, AVK uh, rodenticides. Uh, there are quite some on the market uh, and they will need to be uh, renewed again. And uh, the exercises that we are going to look at uh, chemical alternatives for these uh, substances, which are really hazardous, uh, everybody knows, uh, uh, effects on, on for humans as well as uh, poisons, primary and secondary poisoning in the environment. 
Um, so we look at chemical alternatives and we look at uh, non-chemical alternatives, rodent traps. Um, where we recently had a public consultation, so we launched a consultation to get some information on, uh, on non-chemical alternatives. And we got a, a huge response, so we got more than uh, so we were close to 1500 uh, submissions. And that's good to see on the one hand, of course it's a lot of work for us to process all this information, but that was also the expectation that this is the second renewal of these products and uh, yeah, the rodent trap market, if I may call it that, is really uh, increasing. So that is also reflected now in uh, what came to us. So yeah, we will also for sure look at uh, non-chemical alternatives, so whether these rodent traps can replace uh, these uh, anticoagulant rodenticides. Um, yeah, and then we will bring that to uh, to uh, the committee meeting, hopefully by the end of uh, this year. So, yeah, it, it's going to be uh, uh, an opinion which for sure will be different compared to the one we had before. We have formed also now the committee that this is coming, that they can start to prepare, because we look to two discussions, one after the summer and then a second one uh, where we would uh, want to adopt the opinion in December. Okay. Very good. Sounds like there's a lot to, to look forward to and many interesting discussions mm -hmm. ahead. Okay, that's all I had uh, had this time, unless you have something to add. No, no, no that's it okay. from our side. Great. Um, then in that case, I'd like to thank you, Eric. You're welcome. For sharing these highlights with us. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and as said, we'll catch up again after the next meeting, which will take place in June, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Until then, if you want to go back to our earlier episodes on the Biocidal Products Committee or listen to our other podcasts, you can find them on your favorite podcast channel. Safer Chemicals Podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals.